I got kind of mesmerized watching them and listening to that song. I forgot I had to come up here. <laughs> Thank you for leading us so beautifully, all of you. We're grateful. Let's pray. Father, we heard a song a moment ago about your Holy Spirit leading us, speaking to us, and working in us. And as we've been learning about your Holy Spirit, we ask now that you, Holy Spirit, would speak to our hearts the words we need to hear. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we've uh, shown the cute kids video. You've seen the dedications on stage. We've given the traditional Mother's Day greeting. And I just want to say, I know in a room this size, for some of you, Mother's Day is not a happy, cute, sweet time. It's a mixed bag. For some of you, it's maybe a painful time. Perhaps you've recently lost your mother or estranged from your mother or long to be a mother and that hasn't been in God's plan thus far. We want you to know there's grace for you as well. In fact, I know that because in my own family, Mother's Day is a bit of a double-edged sword for my wife who lost her mother to pancreatic cancer five years ago on Mother's Day. She carries with her a card her mother wrote to her for the last Mother's Day card she would ever write to her daughter and reads it every Mother's Day. And it's not that it's all sadness, there's sweetness, but there, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. I think life is like that, isn't it? Laughter and tears are awfully close together in our lives. You ever laugh so hard you cry? You ever cry so hard you start laughing? They're really close together. Tears and laughter, sorrow and joy, suffering and hope run side by side in human experience. You might find this hard to believe, but when I was a freshman in college, for one semester, I was an art major. I'm not making it up. Your reaction was the same as those students in the class. When I went to my first art class, I'm like, what are you doing here? They all wore like black and olive green and had shaved hair, and I was wearing t-shirts. Anyway, one of the paintings that stuck with me when learning in art history was from Vincent van Gogh in his early life. I found out from a Dutch friend that you don't say van Gogh, you say van Gogh. But we're Americans, we butcher everyone's name, so we're gonna say van Gogh. This is painting is called At Eternity's Gate. And you might not know this, but Van Gogh, who was not known until after he died, he was not appreciated, his work, work was not prized. He was pretty much lived in obscurity and poverty until his, long after his death. And now we know him as one of the fathers of modern art. He, his first job was as a pastor, a minister in a tiny rural village in Belgium to coal mining families. And this is from those years, the early years of his work. It's called At Eternity's Gate. And you can't look at that painting, at least I can't, without imagining that's a man in, in anguished prayer. He's praying, but it doesn't look to be a joyful prayer. Looks like he's got some, some burden he's carrying. Some pain, perhaps. When I see that image, I think about that, and I think that's one of the things that the very heart, the Bible describes and explains to us in Romans chapter 8, which we're going to look at together. Romans 8, verses 18 through 27. The Apostle Paul here writing, Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is a profound passage. It's it's deep theology and practical relevance for our lives. Do you notice there's an unusual word that's repeated a bunch of times in this passage in Romans 8? Did you catch it? What's that unusual word? It's not, I know normally if you just say Jesus in church, you're right. This is one of the few examples where that would not be the right answer. What, what, did you catch the word that it repeat, comes up repeatedly? Groan. Groaning. Groaning. Did you hear it? There's a lot of groaning going on. Creation groans. 
We groan and the Spirit groans. Everybody's groaning. Well, what does groaning mean? The word in Greek actually means death pains or birth pains. Deep groaning. This, is, this passage is really, it, it's telling us, it's putting our, our groaning and our suffering in perspective. It's placing us in the story of God, which is so important. Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, said, life can only be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. I mean, you have to move forward in your life. You can't get stuck in one place. You've got you've to move. But you can only understand where you're going and who you are and why it all matters by looking backward, not just at your history, but at, the, at history, at the story of God in the Bible. Where are you in the story? Where did we place our lives? That's what Paul's doing. You notice the first verse, he says, I consider our present sufferings as not worth comparing to what? The glory that will be revealed. He's saying, yes, we suffer. This present life involves suffering and groaning and pain. That's a reality. We don't deny it. A Buddhist would say, sin and suffering and evil is an illusion. We must meditate our way out of it. The Bible says it's not an illusion. It's not illusory. It's real. But it's, it's not the end of the story. And it's not worth comparing to what's coming. That's what Romans 8 is doing, helping us live forward by looking backward. First thing I want to examine here is what we might call our weakness. Paul does not ignore or deny sufferings. He puts them in context. Why is this so that we experience this? Let me read verses 18 through 22 again. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Did you notice that it's not just us who groans, right? Creation groans as well. Why? Because it, Paul says it's been subjected to futility. Your Bible might say corruption or frustration. What does that mean? And why did that happen? Well, he says, not by its own will, but by the one who subjected it. Now, what's, what is all that about? He's putting us in the story of God. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created all that exists, heavens and the earth, and all creatures, including us. And he said it is better than average, right? My two, my two oldest are home from college, and they're checking online to see if their grades are in yet. See what they got. Did God say, and it's 98%. What did he say? It's good. It's very good. And then in two chapters, we make it not so good. Our sin, our rebellion, causes not only consequences to us, Adam and Eve, the first humans, but there's a cosmic consequence, in other words. Right down to the present time, Paul says, groaning, creation and growth. In other words, the rocks didn't sin, the trees didn't rebel, the birds didn't uh, disobey God, we did. And you might be saying, well, I wasn't there. Adam and Eve, as our spiritual father and mother heads, they did. And we inherited their sinful nature, and we have, in our own way, rebelled against God, all of us, the Bible says. And it's not, it's not that just, you know, you made a few mistakes, that only affects you. It's that the world now is off how God intended. There have been cosmic consequences to all of creation. Like in a family, when a, if a father who's abusing alcohol and, and making terrible choices thinks, well, you know, this is my life, I can do what I want, and, and think horribly mistakenly that it's not going to impact his wife and his children and his grandchildren and people around him. The Bible says there's generational sin. Sins of the fathers can visit themselves to the third and fourth generation. Some of you know that firsthand. In other words, it's not true that just your own mistake only affects you. Well, on a cosmic level, the Bible says that's what's happened. And we don't have time to get into this, but if you've ever been asked the question, why would a good God allow terrible things in the world? Romans 8 is addressing that question. Creation groans. It, creation didn't sin, we did. And because of our sin, God subjected all of it that he made good to frustration, futility, groaning, in other words, that it should be different than it is. You, we see this in science. The second law of thermodynamics, some of you engineering science types know this, says that in, in a system, entropy never decreases. It increases, meaning stuff's breaking down. We go from order to disorder to chaos. 
The universe is expanding. Our sun is not, it's going to burn out someday. Your body, I hate to tell you, you look pretty good on Mother's Day, but most, some, you're, you're, you're breaking down. Have you known that yet? If you don't believe that, just give it time. You're getting weaker, older, uglier. <laughs> I mean, on a relative scale. Let's just move on. The point is, when, when we sin, Paul says, the, all of the creation was thrown off. And there's a groaning going on in creation. So that, that's where we are in the story, right? We are after the cosmic fall, after Christ's redeeming work on the cross and resurrection, so the rescue has happened, but we're before the fulfillment of that perfection. So that's why we have laughter and tears so close together. This is why in our life we have pain and, and joy, hope and sorrow in the same life and experience, in the same day, in the same moment. Because we're living between the rescue and the full redemption and rest restoration. This is why it's so important. Paul says, places us in the story. For all the brokenness and corruption in the world, there are still moments of transcendent glory, aren't there? Aren't there? Don't you get glimpses in creation of the goodness and glory and grandeur of it? Maybe not so much in Illinois. Although at, at our baptism, or, or, excuse me, our dedication class, which was here on Monday night, afterwards some of the families, we walked out. I walked out to my car and right out there, right out past, you know, the Persinger Peck Farms there, the sunset was just glorious. It was a little transcendent moment before I got in my car and drove home and turned on sports talk radio and stopped paying attention to the world, <laughs> right? It's, whoa, look at that. Little moment. We get those moments, don't we? Sometimes it happens in your own life. Little moments of transcendent glory and God's goodness in your family, in the love of a, for a spouse or, a, or your child or a sibling or in creation. But they're mixed with brokenness and pain and injustice and suffering and corruption, which we see on a daily basis. When I was a youth pastor I, here, I had a, a group of guys that were high school football players that met at my house. I was a volunteer football coach and youth pastor here, and we would meet on Wednesdays for a Bible study, and we we're talking about the glory of God and creation. These are all 16, 17 year old meathead guys who play football. And I had come to love a poet named Gerard Manley Hopkins, who's a 17th century metaphysical poet. I found out about him because C.S. Lewis said he was his favorite metaphysical poet. <laughs> and I, he wrote a poem called God's Grandeur, which I thought, I'm going to read this to these guys. It was a risk, I admit. <laughs> they laughed at me and made fun of that for, and still to this day, some of them attend this church and make fun of that. So I th I'm, I'm assuming you're more mature than 16 year old high school football players. I'm going to read to you the poem now. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men not now seek his rod? Generations have trod and have trod and have trod. And all is smeared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge, shares man's smell, the soil. Is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness of deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over a bent world broods with warm breast and ah, bright wings. Now I should read that five times slowly for you to get it, but I won't. Do you hear what he said? He, he said, the universe is charged with the grandeur of God. It, it will flame out like shine. You ever, you ever shake tinfoil with its glistens off the light? It's like the shining out of God's goodness in creation. But at the same time, it's smeared and bleared and smudged and broken. There's toil and labor and corruption right together. But through it all, do you love that image of the Holy Spirit brooding over this broken world full of God's glory and brokenness with bright wings? That's the place we are in the story. This is what all the groaning is about. Our suffering is not pointless. Okay, this next, the Spirit's work. So our weakness is part of the corruption of the world and where we are in the story. The second, the Spirit's work. At this point, our groaning, uh, this is where God does his best work, at the place of your groaning, at the place of your longing to be different than you are. How many of you walked in here this morning and thought, I am as good as I need to be and probably will ever be? Anybody? You've made it? I'd like to meet with you after. Most of us, 
have a sort of, we don't say it, but a deep sense that we're not all we should be or could be or desire to be. We ought to be better than we are. And not only us, but I know you believe this. Don't you look out at the world and think it ought to be different than it is. How many of you look at the injustice done to children across the globe or the abuse of women in our culture and think, well, you know, we, we have this groaning, don't we? It ought to be different. It ought to be different. This is the place the Spirit wants to do His work in us. Let me read Romans eight twenty three. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Now, we'll pause there. I'll read 26 in a minute. This is an amazing verse here. What is the first fruits of the Spirit? What does he mean? We who have the first fruits of the Spirit. If you're with us in our series on Ephesians, the Apostle Paul in chapter 1 of Ephesians verses 13 and 14 said that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is a down posit guaranteeing what is to come, our inheritance. A first fruit, if you will. The Spirit in you seals you, comes into your life when you trust in Jesus Christ, and is a taste, a first fruit of what's to come. You ever find yourself doing the right thing for the right reason and kind of catch a moment and go, whoa, I, I, that just happened, I just did that. I just was kind to somebody for no, no good reason. I, I just didn't say the terrible thing that I sometimes want to say when my spouse and I get into it. I held back and I, and I withheld that and I, and I offered love and, and grace and said, you ever, anybody ever have somebody? And you kind of marvel at yourself, whoa. Paul says, yeah, that's, that's a first fruit. That's a little taste of what's to come in your own life. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, we don't always do that. In fact, uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote a book called The Nature of True Virtue. He said that in our, you know how the Bible says in different places there's no one who does good? Nobody does good? Have you ever heard that and thought, well, that's ridiculous. People do good. Even those who don't believe in God do good. What he means is, what the Bible's saying is, on, on the, for something to be good, it must be truly good, both in its form and in its motive. Which of us ever does anything for a 100% purely selfless and God-honoring motive? Jonathan Edwards, in his book, The Nature of True Virtue, says, we harbor the roots of sin in our efforts to do and to be good. For example, how many of you grew up in a family where your mother said to you, just wait till your father gets home? I did. <laughs> she said it frequently. To me, not my sisters. What, what's that saying? Behave, Jeff, or you're going to get it. Fear of what? Punishment. In other words, fear to cause Jeffrey to behave. Wanting to me to do good, but fostering fear as a motivation. Or maybe you heard this. We don't do that kind of thing around here. We're Frasers, or we're Smiths, or we're whatever, right? You ever hear that? We don't behave that way. We are... What is that harboring? Pride. Pride of family and heritage and self. Be, you're better than those people because you're of this name. In other words, at the very root of our desire and effort to, to be and do good, we foster fear and pride, which are the roots of sin. This side of eternity, we only get glimpses, in other words, of true goodness. The Spirit's work is our groaning to be different and for the world to be different, to speak to us about that. Now, we're, we're told that we groan inwardly as we wait for what? The adoption, eagerly for adoption as children. Now, wait a second. Wait a minute, Paul. If you're saying we groan because we're waiting for our adoption, let's go back for a minute to verses 15 and 16 of chapter 8. Let me read these to you. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is uh, the Aramaic word for like Dada, Daddy, the intimate childlike word for Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How can Paul in verses 15 and 16 say we have the spirit of adoption, we're children of God, and then in verse 23 say we're waiting eagerly to be children of God. Which is it? This is what theologians call the already but not yet reality of our existence. We've already been adopted by Christ's death on the cross paying for our sin, but we have not yet fully realized what that means until he comes again. We're already positionally his children, but we do not yet live that way all the time. We have the spirit of adoption, but not always the reality of it. 
Meaning, I don't always believe it. Sometimes I doubt it. Sometimes it doesn't look like it. Sometimes things in, around me cause me to question it. But the Spirit testifies with my spirit that I am his child, that I do belong to him. When my kids were little, you, you probably have your own bedtime traditions, right, moms and dads? When my kids were little, we had several of them. But one of them was I would ask them three questions. The first question was, who loves you more than the whole wide world? And I taught them the answers, so, you know. And the answer was God. God loves you, or, excuse me, mommy and daddy love you more than the whole wide world. And who loves you even more than that? The answer is God. And then the set, third question was, what's the most important thing in your whole life? And this is the one that was hard to memorize. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, every night, who loves you more than the whole wide world? Mom and dad. Who loves you even more than that? God does. What's the most important thing? Love God and love people. Like moms and dads, it, what's the most, if you could strip all the desires you have for your kids down to one thing, what would it be? If they could just know one thing. Remember Billy Crystal in City Slickers? The meaning of life is this. Your finger? No. One thing. Right? What is the one thing you want them to know? But wouldn't it be true? It's not get good grades, work hard, achieve. What would it be? I want you to know that we love you. I want you to go through life with the foundational knowledge that mom and dad love you. And you might not always live like it. You might do things that break our hearts. You might wander from that love. But I want you to know deep down in your soul that you're loved. Don't you have that as a desire for your kids? No matter how old they are? And wouldn't you add to that, I want you to know beyond my love, which is imperfect, as deep as it is, that God loves you. Let that define you wherever you go in life. Paul is saying that's the Spirit's job in you. His work in your heart is to say to your spirit, if you're in Christ, I know it doesn't look like it all the time. I know you're tempted to question it. I know people around you tell you you're not worth much, but you belong to God. You're my son. You're my daughter, and I love you. That's the Spirit's work. We look out of the corrupt and, and broken and groaning world. When you groan yourself about how you ought to be different than you are, it's the Spirit's work to answer that. And to say, the Spirit testifies with our spirit. We are children of God. And then he goes on. In, in fact, I remember, this reminds me, when I was a youth pastor years ago, and, and Miss Juanita Garnett Williams on the far south side of Chicago in Roseland, an old African-American woman who was, uh, we would see her every year when we went, she's passed on now, is with Jesus, but she would meet our group, and she lived by herself on, a, on, a, on a, a street that had a lot of abandoned homes and crack houses in a very dark and difficult part of the city. She had such joy, though. If you saw her and you said, how are you, Miss Williams? She said, I'm blessed and highly favored, child, and so are you. One time when I first met her, she said, hey, you want to see something? And I said, sure. And she pulled off her wig. <laughs> and she had a shiny black bald head with like a caved in part of her head, like where she'd had brain surgery from brain cancer, like a big scar in her head, like I had a dent in it. And she goes, this is where the Lord saved me. It freaked all the kids out, the students, you know. <laughs> and, and Reverend Tony of the pastor of the church said, when a woman in this, in this part of the city asks if you want to see something, don't automatically say yes. <laughs> anyway, that's not part of the order. <laughs> She, she would hum all the time, hum these old hymns and spiritual songs. Mm, I can't do it like she would do it. Mm -hmm, she'd just hum all day. And one time, one of our students, a young girl, asked her, Miss Williams, what are you humming? She said, oh, that's between me and God, child. She said, you see, when you hum, the devil can't understand you. Now, I don't know if that's theologically accurate, <laughs> but I like the image there, right? I'm humming a song to God between me and my, and my father, just that only he knows. And he's given me, in other words. And nothing, the brokenness and the groaning of his neighborhood can't take that song away. I like to think that she's singing it out now in his presence. So in verse 26 now, we'll go back to that for a minute. In verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. How many of you have ever felt the urge to pray, but you just didn't know what to say, and you couldn't find the words? I felt that way more often than I'd like to admit. We all have. A longing to cry out to God, but I don't even know what to say. I don't even know where to start. I can't find the words. You should underline and circle and highlight and write this verse down. 
when, our, when we don't know what to pray for as we are, the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Let me explain this with a simple analogy from parents and children. How many of you moms and dads in here can remember when your kids were like one, maybe four, between one and two, and they were learning a few words, mommy, daddy, yes, no, but they didn't have all the words yet. And they would know what they wanted, but they didn't know how to say it. Do you remember that stage? I know what I want, but I don't have the word for it, so what would they do? Mm, mm, ah, right? They would groan. They would make sounds, right? Mm. My son Benjamin, like before he was three, we thought he's just only going to grunt his whole life. He just never, everything was a grunt. His, his siblings talked for him, right? And you as a parent, what do you do? Well, what I did is ask my wife, what does he want? You know, <laughs> but you often could discern the different groans. They weren't all the same to you, right, moms and dads? You could tell this is a hungry groan. This is I want my ducky or bear or whatever groan. I, this is whatever. I'm mad. You could tell by the way they, you just knew them. That's like what Paul is saying the Spirit does in us. Ugh. I don't know what, even what to say, God. And the Spirit knows. Oh, I know what kind of groan that is. That's a groan of a man who wants to love his wife better. <sighs> That's the groan of a mom who's heartbroken over her child's decision. The Spirit knows. When you can't find the words and you sit and you inwardly groan like, like a parent, like your loving father, he knows. And, and so what do you do, moms and dads, when your children are, are groaning? You give them language. You teach them vocabulary for the things they want, don't you? You teach them, what, what, here's what, you're, what, you, what you want, son. Here's what you want, daughter. And you give them words. That's what the Spirit does for us. It's what the Word of God does for us. Gives us a vocabulary for prayer. And as good parents, you also teach your kids things that they would not say otherwise, like please and thank you and I'm sorry, right? The Spirit also teaches us language that we would not otherwise know. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, writes, Meantime, however, we want to know not how we should pray if we were perfect, for we are not and no one is, but how we should pray being as we now are. It is of no use to ask God with a fastidious earnestness for A, when our whole mind is in reality filled with a desire for B. We must lay, him before, we must lay before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us, and trust his spirit to sort it out. I love that. There are several encouragements I want to give you from this verse before we move on, the last little brief point. First is this. Suffering and corruption and brokenness in your life and in the world is not a sign of God's absence. There are many in our culture today who would post that proposition that, well, evil and suffering is a sign that it is no God. If we take Paul at his word, this means telling us that our groaning over the brokenness of the world is actually not a sign of God's absence, but of his presence. We long for things to be right. How, what is right. Where does right come from? How would we know what right is? Where does that longing come from? If not the hope that someday it will be right, and there is one who can make it right. So we should weep over injustice. We should groan over our brokenness. But we should never think this means God's absent. In fact, it means he's present. And we're in that part of the story before he comes and makes it right. Second, this, and I hope this encourages some of you, you don't have to know the right words for God to hear your prayer. Isn't that good news? You don't have to get the theology right. You don't have to say it right for God to go, that doesn't make any sense grammatically. I'm not listening to that person, right? <laughs> It doesn't work like that. He hears your groans, even your unintelligible prayers, even your nonsensical babbling, he knows. He hears you. He intercedes and he interprets it. And third, your groaning over your own brokenness and the brokenness of the world is actually evidence of the Spirit's work in you. Even a groan of I, I ought to be different is evidence that you, of the Spirit is working, cultivating a desire in you. I hope that it encourages me. I hope that encourages you. Last, the Father's will. So we have our weakness and the Spirit's work, and last, the Father's will, or the will of the Father. 
Verse 27, let me read this for you. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What this is saying is that when you pray, even the simplest, most basic prayer, even the prayer of just groaning, when you do that and consistently, what happens over time is the Spirit of God lines your spirit up with the will of the Father. Don't you want your prayers to be in alignment with God's will? How many of us want to know God's will? How many of you would like to know God's will? I'll just say this. If you're not in his word and you're not praying, it's a ridiculous question. How will you know? Paul says the spirit intercedes in our spirit. And as we pray, he makes intercession for all the saints, the people who belong to Jesus, to line us up in accordance with the will of God. Which means some of your prayers don't get answered. At least not the way you pray them. How many of you are grateful for unanswered prayers in your life? <laughs> Lewis says, if God had answered all the silly prayers I prayed in my life, where I shudder to think where I would be right now. I remember praying that God would save a relationship with a girl that I was in. I am so glad I'm not married to her. <laughs> it was a wrong prayer to pray. But, but, but at the deepest level, there was a groan in that prayer. All prayers at their core have a good groan. I wanted to find the woman God had for me. The silly part was I thought I knew. God knew. So when we pray, even, even basic babbling prayers, the Spirit lines our hearts up over time with the will of God. That is such good news. So give God your groans. Because you know what he can do with them? He can turn them into Glory. Is that what verse 18 says? I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that is to come. God takes groans and turns them into glory in your life, in our heart, and someday in this world. Even when we don't know what to pray for as we ought, the Spirit takes our groans, lines them up with God's will, and points us to his glory. That's what the Spirit wants to do in you. So give him your groans. He'll turn them into glory. We said a minute ago that we don't know how to pray for as we ought. We don't always have the words. And we thought we'd close the service by giving you some words on this Mother's Day. Some words of blessing and encouragement for not just moms, but grandmothers, aunts, all women who matter to us and to God. And I want to invite Kim Erickson, who's part of our executive council, used to be on our staff, a mother of three, not boys, wonderful young men, um, and, um, and now works for Naomi's house. If you don't know what that is, you can ask her later. It's a, it's a ministry helping women out of the sex trafficking industry. She's a director of operations there. And I know that that work in her came from her own sense of groaning over the injustice in the world. But anyway, I invited her to read this prayer, which we were closing all of our services with this morning. So let's welcome Kim. Thanks, Jeff. Could you join me as we speak a prayer of blessing over all the women that God has placed in our lives? Today, we thank you, God, for the gift of mothers. You tell us that as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. Gentle, patient God, thank you for your tender care. Isaiah wrote that God will never forget us and that he knows each one of us just as a mother knows her own children. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Gentle, patient God, thank you for your tender care. Jesus said that he longed to gather his children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Gentle, patient God, thank you for your tender care. Lord God, we pray for mothers everywhere. Like Sarah, may those who long for children be comforted in their pain. Like Hannah, may those who are given children after a long wait be willing to offer their children back into your care and your service. Like Rachel, may those who grieve over the loss of their children who are missing in death or in other ways trust in your faithful goodness. Like Naomi and Ruth, may those who face great trials and difficulty trust that you can redeem their grief with new life. Like Mary, may we welcome the gift of your Son into our lives. 
Like Lois and Eunice, may we be ready to share the love of Jesus with our children. Loving Father, we pray for those for whom this day is a time of heartache rather than celebration. We pray for those who have lost their mother. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. We pray for those who long to be mothers. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. We pray for those who struggle with the choices their children are making. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. We pray for those who have a difficult relationship with their mother. Heavenly Father, bless them with your love. May we have the comfort of knowing that your love for us is constant. Your understanding is perfect and your compassion is never ending. Loving God, we give you thanks for all who care for us, who have encouraged us and helped us grow, who have forgiven us and cared for us when we are unwell, who have supported us when times were hard, who have challenged us, who have told us about you. Thank you, loving Father. Amen. It's power to behold that, hear that song sung and sing it together. We hope you know that you are loved by your everlasting Father. All of you, this Mother's Day, how much he loves you. By the way, moms, grandmothers, all the ladies here, uh, we have that prayer written out for you on cards at the welcome desk. If you'd like to have a copy of that, feel free to stop by and pick that up as our gift for you, and maybe it'll bless you or someone that you know. We say this every week, but if you're here for, and would like someone to pray with you, pray for you, or just a place to pray. The glass room as you leave is our prayer room, and pray, members of the prayer team would love to meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and may you know by his mercy and grace that you are loved forever. Amen. And go in peace.